Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Come, come up from those in the back. Feel free to grab a seat up front. We have an incredible panel today um, to discuss hate and extremism and coalition building. And I think we have the, the kind of key experts here in California to give us some insight on some critical ways ahead. I'm Joanna Mendelson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Community Engagement for the Los Angeles Federation based in Los Angeles. It is a pleasure to moderate this wonderful panel that we have with us today. Um, uh, before I begin, I just want to, um, to, to kind of level set a little bit. And um, one of the things that, that I was acutely aware of dedicating 21 years of my history to monitoring domestic terrorism and looking at the underbelly of our country, literally the kind of the, the extreme, the fringe neo-Nazis and white supremacists. And I had a very, very acute view into the fact that hate is about demonizing the other. It's about creating an us versus them mentality. And I would like to say that in my studies of neo-Nazis and white supremacists, it was so apparent that the demonization of the other was not, was, we were all part of the same bucket, right? They hated Jews. They hated Jews. Jews are definitely at the top of that kind of pecking order of their ire. But yet, I would qualify them as ecumenical haters. These are individuals who hated Jews, who hated Latinos, who hated African Americans, who hated members of the LGBTQ community. And so one case I was working against a neo-Nazi named Connor Klimo. This is an individual who as part of his plot to attack an LGBTQ bar and the ADL office as well as a synagogue. He also wanted to target women that he had a deep-seated hatred uh, with his misogyny. And so we can look at that underbelly and we can use that as momentum to move forward and move ahead because we can't go at this alone. We have to do it in collaboration and in partnership. We need our allies. And so this incredible panel today will talk about that, the landscape that we have here in America, as well as some of the themes that we see and the ways that they've been effective in their coalition building. So joining me uh, from right to left, from left to right, um, we have uh, a Senator Sidney Kamlager, who represents the 30th district, ranging from Century Cities to South Los Angeles. She was elected to California State Senate in March 2021 in the special elections. You can read more about her bio and each of the bios in on your app today. Um, we're also joined by Assembly Member Laura Friedman, um, who represents the, uh, the 43rd district, and she is currently chair of the Assembly Committee on Transportation and, um, and uh, Environmental Caucus. We have also joining us Santosh Siram Santana, um, who's the Legislative Director for Affirmative Action, CAA, with CAA, and Stop AAPI Hate, where she develops, advocates, and implements the organization's state budget and policy agenda at the state capitol. And last but not least, we're joined by uh, Dr. Sean Landris, is Chair Emeritus of the Los Angeles County Quality and Productive Commission and past chair of the City of Santa Monica Planning Commission, um, who's worked very closely on LA versus Hate Initiative, and we'll hear more about that. So to, to kind of kick this panel off and to kind of give everybody an understanding, can you please, uh, Senator Kamlager, describe the landscape of hate from your vantage point? Microphone first. Yeah, You're yeah. supposed to go first. <laughs> happy to be here. Um, always happy to get an invitation uh, from David Bacarsley, who I uh, cherish immensely, and it's great to see so many friendly faces in the audience and so many constituents. I did give you a shout out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. A few years ago, I had the good fortune of serving on the Select Committee on the State of Hate, chaired by Assemblymember Bloom. We had one of our first hearings at uh, Santa Monica College, I think at the Eli Broad uh, Center, 
and uh, Congressman Liu was there, as well as folks from the FBI, and the numbers that were shared about the rise, the dramatic, alarming rise um, in hate crimes, and specifically uh, with regards to anti-Semitic acts, alarming, disturbing, sobering, how uh, folks are using the internet and the dark web, um, how folks are connecting and communicating with one another and really sort of feeding on people's hate and heightened levels of insecurity about their own livelihood was incredibly distressing, as well as learning that young folks are now you know, getting into the game of anti-Semitism. Um, and as we, at the state, you know, manage budgets and policy priorities, it became incumbent on me to really make sure that we are having these conversations with one another to help folks understand the degree of fear that is out there. I, um, you know, talk with Assemblymember Jesse Gabriel quite frequently, actually, about issues relevant to uh, the Jewish community, and invariably we end up talking about history and culture and fears and really post-traumatic stress syndrome that is um, that sort of sort of is a thread amongst uh, the Jewish community because of you know real life experiences around genocide and trying to exterminate someone's existence. And it's not just a person, it's someone's culture and history. Just last year, a report came out um, that said that for the first time in our history, the United States is a backsliding democracy. Part of it is because of um, the condoning of political violence, and part of it is because of an accelerated uptick in the dissemination of misinformation. And part of that includes um, anti-Semitism. Coupled with, you know, the foreign minister of Russia then making crazy remarks, right, about, um, you know, Jewish folks actually participating in the Holocaust and, you know, neo-Nazism um, in Israel. What? Um, <laughs> and then, you know, reports that then have to be refuted, for example, by uh, presidential nominees around the history of the Holocaust, you can understand why folks who are predisposed to only wanting to be with their own people and being really afraid of others and being susceptible to information that's out there that says, if you don't look like me, if you don't live in my neighborhood, then you're a bad person, you can get a sense of how this kind of madness would proliferate. I am honored to represent the 30th, which is an incredibly diverse community. Um, and so we have all kinds of Jewish folks, right? Progressive, reform, orthodox, conservative. But everyone is interested in safety and protection and being seen. Everyone is interested in being able to work and love and pray and uh, raise their children in communities that are safe. And everyone has the expectation that the state and the county and the city will be their partner. And so my responsibility is to make sure that the state is owning up to our responsibility to do that. Great, thank you so much. That was it. Uh, well, I don't quite remember what the question was, but... Um, <laughs> what does the landscape look like from your perspective in terms of not hate? Because it's, it's, I, mean, I was thinking so much about what Sydney said because um, uh, I think that her experience being on that subcommittee uh, was very, very valuable. And um, so that was a really um, comprehensive response. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm not an expert in hate. Uh, you know, I'm glad that you invited me here, but I don't profess to have any um, deep knowledge beyond what you would think that someone who's a legislator would kind of gleam over the past few years. Uh, I, I will say, so I think legislators see a lot of things through political lenses. 
Uh, and we also see a lot through the lenses of what we experience in our communities talking to different groups of constituencies. So I'll say that the, a lot of that colors uh, any of my responses. Um, what, I, what worries me about our pro, uh, uh, particular political moment is that w I see an incredibly heightened and increasing level of anxiety amongst the population. So COVID certainly pushed us into something that maybe we were heading towards, but it had pushed us there rapidly. I'm like, I live in Los Angeles. I've never met anybody anyone who self-identifies as being Antifa. Like, it just is not a thing. But he thinks that this is the biggest threat to the United States, you know, is Antifa. And I'm like, really? With, like, neo-Nazis? With people, you know, neo-Nazis marching and killing somebody? Like, these guys? But this is the kind of, and, you know, and he feels that there's a big cover-up going on about this. There's, like, that millions of them, there's thousands of them, and they're in cells, and they're sleepers, and it's, like, crazy stuff. Right? I don't know. I mean, you, you explain this, Sydney. Um, you were on the, the select committee. Explain. That. So I, I'm just saying that, you know, when people say there's a link between Jews and COVID, we might say, well, that's ridiculous. But you can't laugh it off. And that there are flyers out there that are, you know, that have dis disseminated around Los Angeles saying that Ukraine, Russia is because of the Jews, that COVID is a Jewish creation. And there's this whole thing about, you know, Soros and Bill Gates is somehow involved and, you know, we're going to microchip people. And it seems like crazy talk, but people believe it. And I do think that social media has a lot to do with it and a lot of responsibility because if you have great power, you also have responsibility. And as far as I can tell, they are, they are not upholding their responsibility to crack down on this. And they have algorithms that are AI algorithms that feed people more and more of the same content once they are exposed to it. So there's nothing that gives them any balance. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And it pushes people kind of, it's like taking people off the street and hearing that they have a germ of something and saying, well, we're going to now put you in a building where it's only people who believe the most extreme version of what you just said until you now believe that. And that's what the internet has been doing. So I think it's a very, very scary and precarious time. And we need to take all of this very, very seriously and find ways of bringing people back to reality and of responding and creating the kind of empathy and understanding that we really need to get people out of those self-selected and AI-selected bubbles that they are now floating inside of. Thank you. Thank you so much for that oh. thorough answer. <laughs> Serum. <laughs> Okay, uh, you guys okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Santosh Siram Santana, the legislative director with Stop Asian Hate. And I can't tell you how delighted I am to be in a room with people um, and not to be looking at small, tiny squares or when you all turn off your video and it's just your name. So it's lovely, lovely, lovely to connect with faces. So apologize if I stare a little bit too hard. <laughs> I've missed the human connection. So um, I wanted to share with all of you what the landscape looks like for our community. Um, when and I think some of the folks have touched on this, but when uh, the pandemic started, the Asian community felt things probably that many of your communities had felt as well. And what we started to get were these phone calls um, from community members. And then what we decided to do was to look at what the Southern Poverty Law Center did, which is a website where you could just go and self-report so when COVID started in March, um, within the course of three months, we had 800 self-reported incidences from our community about hate and harassment. Now, flash forward to where we are today. We are now, we just published our most recent national report, which shows that there's been an increase um, we now, across the nation, there has nearly 11,000 uh, incidences of hate against um, Asians. And um, in California, in California, we lead 
unfortunately, dubiously, with uh, 4,100 incidences of hate and harm. So what I want to share with you is what this looks like for us. Um, I want everyone to, be, to know that a majority of what we experience are not hate crimes. We get lots of calls from legislators wanting to be our champion for hate crimes bills. We do not do that. A majority of what we get, 61% harassment, verbal harassment. In California, we looked at our home state because all of the partners are from California to see what anti-hate looks like. We published a policy report in October directed at state legislators. And what we found out was one, the misogynistic fever that has been with us since time is alive and present in Asian hate. I just want to pause and let everybody in this room take that in. In California, the majority of women in our community reporting is women. It's almost 63% are reporting these incidences. And of those incidences reported, almost 50% are verbal harassment. We get reports of women crossing the street, people yelling at them, go home, you Chinese bat-eating bitch. We get reports of a man following a woman out of public transit, calling her names. Now, it happens to men, but not at the rate that it happens to women. And so that is what it looks like. We have, from that California data, we've introduced three bills. We've taken our community-driven data to introduce three bills. And what we have found is this is not unique to Asians. It is not unique to blacks. It is unique to all women, globally, internationally. It's called street harassment. And I don't have to explain that term to any woman in this room. We all know that it means unwanted, unsolicited acts towards us. The, what people think are compliments, right? So we have introduced three bills to address that. Um, and it's not just for us. It's for every community that is experiencing hate and harm. And so, um, so I, that's what I wanted to share about what the landscape looks like and what we are, this is one sliver of what Stop API Hate is doing. I am one sliver of that work because as you all know, that's a large, large, large amount of work to take on. So thank you for your time and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Santosh. <clears throat> Sean. So I am not Aziza Hassan. <laughs> she's a dear friend and colleague and I'm, I'm honored, um, I'm very sorry that she's not able to be with us this morning, but I'm honored to be able to, um, to pinch hit. And uh, as she and I were communicating over the last day or so, I was sort of thinking about the, the work that we've done together over the past 15 years in so many different ways uh, and really what some of the underlying uh, what, what some of the underlying themes and patterns have been because I think they inform not just what the landscape looks like uh, but also how we might begin to think about uh, taking a second look at that landscape and I'm just I'm really honored to be on the panel with these three distinguished panelists uh, I would say um, Laura, for the amount of time that you spent on housing and transportation, you must be very familiar with hate in California. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> uh, I say this as a planning commissioner, which uh, it's a whole other world. But um, going back to the beginning of, of New Ground and going to the history of New Ground, which, which Aziza leads, I'd like to talk a little bit about relationships and transactions. Because when we look at the landscape of hate, we need to be thinking not just in terms of what it means to intervene and respond, but what it means to be creating a landscape that is one that we feel proud to be part of, but also a landscape that is resilient and able to respond not just with retribution, but with restoration. 
And that's very, very important because so much of hate is learned, right? Hate comes from somewhere. It comes from misinformation, disinformation, from being in an echo chamber, but it also is taught by parents to children. It's also learned on the schoolyard. And there are places where we can respond to hate uh, in a way that actually transforms the people involved instead of punishing them. And we've had long conversations, right, in California and Los Angeles about what it means to rethink the way um, we bring back, we bring people back into the folds of society. So a core lesson that Aziza offers is about having, building the relationships to begin with, having the hard conversations up front, not shying away from conversations that are difficult when we have those conversations and we know one another and we can absorb the, the hopes and the fears and the anger and the frustration of communities around us, then when there is a time where we need to respond, where there's a transaction that needs to occur, we have a basis on which to engage in a trusted, in a trusted way. And I'll bring this directly to a JPAC story, um, which is, I hope there are no reporters in the room, um, which is that very early on, when we were looking to get that initial funding for the nonprofit security grants program, we heard quietly that this was going to move forward if this was not going to be a Jewish only effort. And I think the language was there, the language was there in the, in the, in the bill, but it was clear from the then governor's office that they needed to hear from partners who were not Jewish, right? That, that this was something that they wanted, that this was something that they needed um, for their communities. And it was actually conversations, I had some conversations off, off, off the record with Aziza herself about what it meant to create that nonprofit security program for protecting the Muslim community because Muslims and Jews are at the top of uh, the hate register when it comes to anti-Semitism and Islamophobia in America and California and everywhere else. And because of the relationship that she and I had built, we could have a very candid conversation and come up with a solution that reflected the needs of the Muslim community and very specifically what that meant, and it has developed over the, over the next number of years, is that when the nonprofit security grants programs come out, you know, we in the Jewish community, we, we write grants very, very well. We're used to it. We have professional grant writers in our community. That is not true in every ethnic and religious community around the state. So what was needed at that time, right, was grant writing training for other than Jewish communities so that they could actually see the RFP and say, oh wait, I know how to fill that thing out. I can actually make a compelling application. And that's what happened. What happened was that those grant writing programs were put into place. I say that as a story because what does it reflect? It reflects a relationship that was in place so that we could have honest conversations about what was needed. We could have, um, we could then have a dialogue about what the needs were and how the solutions could be arrived at. And then we could have each other's backs. And that program has grown through the leadership of, of Assembly Member Jesse Gabriel and others to become a statewide program that is actually protecting Jewish, Muslim, Asian, LGBT, women, the, the, the scope of organizations that is at the top of every hater's hate list um, sadly continues to grow. Now the next piece that this leads to is what we can be doing next. And I'm part, I, I, as chair of the Quality and Productivity Commission in, in Los Angeles County, um, I was honored to help advocate for some of the first funding in to a program called LA Versus Hate. And what Santos said is extremely important about the distinction between hate crimes and hate incidents. It's gonna go back to what I said at the beginning about how hate is learned. What we knew was that so much of the hate that was occurring in Los Angeles County was not happening through the context of a criminal activity. And moreover, this is something I learned recently and was surprised to learn, hate crimes, hate crimes charges, all too frequently are traded away in plea bargains, which means that they're frequently charged as something to 
um, sharpen right a prosecution, and then they're just as quickly taken off the table in exchange for a plea bargain, which means that we don't see the conviction rates that we ought to be seeing for hate crimes. And that's, that's really true. But it also suggests that maybe we're looking in the wrong place. And what LA versus hate does in partnership with 211 LA County, and I'm very happy to say that this is now potentially expanding to other communities in California, thanks to leadership statewide and um, even beyond California is taking a look at this. People call 211 because they're looking for housing help, their kids being bullied at school, they have a health crisis, and those interviewers then collect information. I hope everyone knows about 211 in general, but using 211 calls to track where hate incidents are taking place gives us an opportunity to create a heat map in collaboration with, say, other data coming from LAPD, sheriff, other uh, law enforcement, and other agencies. And then you start to see where the hate is occurring in a community, and you can come up with a response that is non-punitive, that is not about law enforcement, that's not about retribution, but is actually about saying, we have a crisis over here in this community. What can we do? How can we intervene? How can we make, build relationships? And if it's in a school setting, how can we create a restorative process to actually address the underlying issues that are leading to the expression of hate? And it's been, it's been powerful and transformative. It has also sadly, and this, will, this is where I'll close, led to some, I'll just share, share some statistics. 75% of the calls to 211 LA County that are, 75% of the hate, crime, uh, hate incident reports are about religious and ethnic discrimination, right? Um, Many of them are about, many of them are about misogyny, right? Directly about misogyny. I believe I saw a statistic that um, not one in three callers, but one in three Asian women in the San Gabriel Valley reports having been the target of hate. Not one in three callers, one in three people, one in three women in particular, right? Imagine this room, could one third, or one third of you, right? Have you experienced hate in some form? That's an extraordinary number and totally unacceptable. And then we've heard that one in five uh, calls included uh, attacks on people because of their disability status, which is just, which is just extraordinarily heartbreaking. So we're going to see what well, we see those numbers. We see the progress, and um, hopefully, we no, will I, get some more. And I appreciate that because I think each of our panelists paint this, this depressing picture, right? We have not only disinformation, conspiracies, uh, this larger uh, lion's den of hate that's spewed in the virtual space, but actual real world action on the ground of those who are acting out on these beliefs. So now that we've been sufficiently depressed in regards to the landscape, let's turn this conversation into what can we mobilize around? Can we get two perspectives of this conversation, one from our elected leaders, what can you as leaders do in order to change the trajectory of our country, of, of our state? What, you know, what are the steps that you can do in, in order to kind of be, use your bully pulpits in order to affect change? Oh yeah, now, now you start with me. Thank you, Sydney. Um, well, I don't, th I think, so, as a Jewish caucus member, very proud of the su success of the security grant program. Glad to see that it's recognized for its importance and that we're gonna have hopefully more money in this year's budget. And we're not going to security our way out of this problem. Uh, we know that. Um, that is the uh, fail safe we need to keep our cultural institutions safe and people feel safe attending them. But we have to try to push back on the hatred and the conspiracies and the issues at the source. So look, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I'll just give you some thoughts that I've had about this. Uh, number one, we've seen in the last several years, again, I think it all does start with politics at the very top. We've seen a kind of normalization of people expressing hatred at, in every level being normalized. Uh, people, uh, politicians going on television and saying things that they wouldn't have been able to say t seven years ago, 10 years ago, people, they would have been shunned. And yet we've normalized that and that uh, gives license to other people 
to also express the same kind of hatred and conspiracies. And I'd say with the conspiracies, we see, all you have to do is watch Fox News to see them feeding into a lot of the same paranoia. I would say one of the most dangerous threads right now running through, and it started a couple years ago with QAnon, is this idea that there are these networks of groomers, pedophilia, pedophiliac groomers. The reason it's so dangerous is because if you look back historically, crimes against children has been for decades, generations, the excuse of dictators to imprison and commit genocide. That people will accept genocide against populations if they are convinced that these are people who prey on children. They did that to the Jews, the pogroms, Hitler, you know, Jews were drinking the blood of children, they were sacrificing children. So we of all people should know how dangerous this is. And now there are people who believe that democratic politicians are engaged in systemic grooming of children um, to, I don't know, trade them on the internet. I don't even understand exactly what we're supposed to be doing with these children, but, and we see it get used against the LGBT and the trans community as well. And, and people now will say it on television. Politicians will say this. We have politicians calling each other groomers. It's really, really dangerous and we can't allow it to be normalized. So we have to push back strongly when we see people using anti-Semitic or other type of hate rhetoric. And we have to do it as a community and even the subtle forms of it need to be pushed back on. And I'll give you a couple examples of how this plays out subtly. We've seen flyers in the last few years in California against Jewish candidates using money, dollar bills in the background, exaggerating what they see as Semitic features through cartoons, uh, shading to make people look more Jewish, and always with this idea that somehow they're bought off or they're corrupt through money. It's an anti-Semitic trope, and we have to push back on it. We saw a flyer up against a, woman's, a woman candidate uh, likening her to playing with Barbies. There was something about you know, infant, infantilizing her as being you know, a girl um, unwilling. I myself have seen, have been, you know, seen uh, people openly using misogynistic types of responses against me uh, on Twitter. Um, I'll give you a, an example where no one picked up on it, no one pushed back, but it stuck with me. So no secret, I've been in this sort of fight about high-speed rail in California whole other issue, another panel for another day. Um, but one of the proponents of high-speed rail, who generally these folks are on my side, unlike everything else, so that's what's ironic, was talking about electrification and about catenaries. And his, his way of demeaning me was to say, oh, ick, never could say that against a male politician, right? But to say that I don't like something in policy because I'm a girl and I'm squeamish about it, that is a misogynistic attack. So these are the kinds of things that we, all of us, should call out, not for ourselves, but for each other. If only a male, a man who had seen that, even if they weren't on my side, had said, you know what, you crossed the line. That's attacking her, that's demeaning her for being a woman, not about a policy position. So we need to all look for these opportunities to be allies for each other, right? And, and not allow it to be, to just go by or to normalize it, even in its most sort of, subtle forms. So I think calling that out is one thing. And then one other thing I'll say is a lot of the, the anxiety and the anger comes from real places. People feeling that they don't have opportunities. People feeling that, the, they're, that they're, they're nervous about their own future and their family's future. Lack of pensions. I don't have one. I don't know what I'm gonna do you know, down the road. When we leave, we don't get health care. By the way, people don't realize that, so how do I provide for my family? How does my eight-year-old daughter get health care I'm, if I'm no longer in the legislature? That's it for me, you know, I'm way up here compared to where a lot of people are. They don't have health care, they don't have pensions, they're being paid salaries that don't allow them to uh, uh, feel secure about paying their rent every month. So when people are scared and anxious and under pressure, they lash out at other people. It, it's gotta be someone's fault. Whose fault is it? It's maybe a political party. Maybe it's the Jews' fault. They have all the money. They control the media. It, it's the one thing leads to another. So if we can get to those root causes and try to support people better, that helps with a lot of things. Crime, homelessness, you know, all those things that are making people upset and anxious, there are real world solutions to those. If we're willing to do the work 
I see more hatred right now directed towards home, people that are homeless than any other population. They are being dehumanized to a point where I, it's, it's hard for me to even have discussions with residents with the anger I see. And I try to say the homeless is not a race of people, right? I mean, this is people who are experiencing something in their current life. They didn't start out that way, right? They started out like all of us. And the fastest growing population, by the way, are senior women. Yes. Senior women. So trying to find ways of humanizing populations that are currently being dehumanized is tough. But I think for our role as legislators, that's what we have to do is to push back over and over again. The homeless dehumanization is something that I feel that I'm constantly trying to do in every interaction I have with people. And again, the people that are, that are doing this are people who themselves are scared, so it's hard. You know, they're I get nervous walking here from across the building because of people who are currently homeless and possibly mentally ill or substance abusing to, to the point where they're frightening to me. So I get that, you know, yeah, it's very easy for me to be like, God, someone should just take these people and put them on a bus and take them somewhere else because they're scaring me. So I find that I have to do it myself, but I, as a legislator, it's my responsibility in my community to also make people open their hearts to people that are having a hard time. So I think there's that. And I will just say just practically, we do a lot of town halls. You know, one thing that I can do that normal people can't do is I can have uh, events that I can host where I look for opportunities to bring people together with other people. So my, my staff has said to me, Let's do a town hall about homelessness. And I said, let's do a town hall about homelessness where the only panelists are people who are experiencing homelessness or who were formerly homeless. And they said, really, you wanna do that? I mean, why? This is why. So we need to look for those opportunities to bring people together. I represent a huge population of, of Armenian Americans and recent immigrants, they're the largest outside of Armenia. You know, this is a population that certainly is experiencing hate crimes as well and yet also is very isolated and sometimes you know, doesn't understand what other groups might be going through. And there's a lot of sort of intercultural conflict that plays out in Los Angeles. As much as we're a melting pot, we also see you know, these sorts of, of conflicts between groups. So using my bully pulpit, my resources to bring groups of, of ethnicities with other groups of ethnicities, Glendale has a week of remembrance where they do a whole week about the Armenian genocide, but bringing in other genocides, other groups. So trying to kind of push that as far as I can from my position to use it to bridge those gaps and create alliances, I think is really a, an important role for legislators to play outside of the policy-making role. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I go to Santush, if we don't mind, just to hear from the community and from advocacy groups, what are the innovative ways and, and initiatives, legislative actions you've taken to create cohesion and coalition building? And we have two minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's a really solve the world's problem, yeah. right? Okay. All I can I just really appreciate what you had to say because it goes. Often we look to legislators to fix stuff, and you're working on the margins. There's not a whole lot they can do. So to actually put this on their shoulders is um, is a disservice. Uh, you know, we took the community data that we received and we translated it, and what it showed us is what we needed to do in our state. And there's two bills, um, AB 2549 by Assemblywoman Bonta and SB 1161 by Senator Min. And our approach, first of all, the first bill, we went to an Afro-Latina and we went to a black woman, Dr. Weber and Assemblywoman Bonta, because we needed to make strategic alliances with other communities of color. It's not enough to say we are in solidarity and we're an allyship. We gotta walk our talk. So working with women of color was one of the main things that we thought was important to do. And what our bill does, <clears throat> if um, the street harassment bill passes, it would be the first in the nation. Uh, California would be the first uh, state in the nation to look at street harassment as a public health issue. And we are also not taking a carceral, um, we're taking a non-carceral approach. None of our bills want to give law enforcement a reason, pretext, to over-police black and brown communities. 
our bills look at, a, at street harassment as a public health issue, to change behavior, to take something out of the closet and shine light on it, to name it, to educate people, to have a public education campaign, and it's all based on our community data and what we're hearing from our community. So um, I know that's some of the bills that you have prioritized, so thank you for doing that. Um, and we also ask transit. A lot of street harassment happens in transit. A lot. And we're asking the top 10 transit agencies in the state of California to change that, to um, look at their policies, their programs, their procedure, their lighting, their bus stops, everything, and make sure women and other vulnerable groups are safe, that they have autonomy to move through the world to get where they need to get to and take care of their lives. So those are some of the things that we're doing through legislation, um, but as the Assemblywoman mentioned, there's so much more that we could be doing. I want to leave the last word oh. to Sydney, who I, I remember going, I mean, I'm curious to, you've, you've served in so many different roles as well, going back to um, <clears throat> the community colleges as well, where, where there, is, there is tremendous promise um, and, and work to be done and um, perhaps, perhaps yet um, other stages to do this work. Um, I want to ask this crowd, I want to ask this crowd three asks, three things that you can do right now. Um, or when you go home. Number one, find someone who doesn't look like you or think like you and invite them into a conversation about the things that matter to you. Make that commitment to invite someone else into a conversation and start that relationship. The second thing is uh, look into for your organizations and for yourselves upstander training. Um, what Laura said about uh, Denormalizing and humanizing is absolutely critical. We have to find ways, and it's hard. I will say this as a, as, a, as a serving commissioner and board member. When somebody says something truly awful, it's hard to know what to do, right? It's really actually difficult because you don't want to give them the too much time of day. You, 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 want, you don't want the meeting to get derailed, but you also want to say that's not okay. There are trainings available in everyone's community about how to be an effective upstander, and I want to encourage everyone, carry that back to your organization and find ways to denormalize, de-escalate, and humanize. And the third thing, as a local government official, I want to plead with you to participate in public comment in the, in the decisions that are taken by your local governments. The level of discourse has gone from bad to truly horrifically catastroph catastrophically awful. And we need people with your uh, values, with your skills, with your, with your thoughts to actually change the tone in local government because that's where the work gets done, in the town halls. Show up to a town hall and say something normal, humanizing, de-escalating, rational and help change what the expectations are, what the standards are in your community. So those three things, um, please, I hope that you will do those. Great action steps, Sean, great. Senator Kamlager, would you like to close this out? I'll be really quick, it will sound random, but it isn't. I do wanna say uh, that I believe that oftentimes hate is an outward response to someone's own fragility, and so, um, how we receive and then manage it is really important. This is an amazing opportunity to really uplift behavioral and mental health and making sure that those investments are going into communities up and down the state, regardless of your race, your gender, your ethnicity, um, sexual orientation, or even income level, because we deal with mental health in various ways and we also stigmatize and shame it. I'm not a fan of the penal code, um, and so I don't think that all of the answers reside within the legislature. In fact, I think the answers reside in rooms like this. Um, you know, Judge Wesley is a friend of mine, and he runs uh, Shades and Hate Crimes. It's a, a organization in Los Angeles, and you know, when young people are in school acting out and doing some really bad things, instead of throwing them into the court system, he actually throws them to Shades and um, allow them to tell their story and be judged by their peers. That is, um, and they focus on, they have one on just bad stuff, and then they have another on hate incidents. And a lot of, most of the hate, hate incidents deal with anti-Semitic acts. And so how do we uplift and connect, right, and partner with folks like that who are doing that really good work so that we're, 
getting to young people before they um, age into wildness. Um, you know, I don't want to get into this. I know this might be a third rail for some folks, but you know, last year there was this ethnic studies curriculum bill, and it certainly caused a lot of stuff going on in people's community. That's what Jesse told me. But for the legislators, it actually created a real opportunity to talk about what ethnic studies means and how communities can see themselves reflected in curriculum and what anti-Semitism looks like. And so how do we actually use those opportunities to create a space for deeper conversations to happen is really important. And so it's also really important for us to hear from you when those kinds of bills come up. Because for like three weeks, there was intense discussion about very personal issues relative to the Jewish community and to the African American community and to the API community and to the Muslim community that we probably hadn't had and we wouldn't have had without that kind of piece of legislation. And so those kinds of things are really important. The last thing I'm just gonna share is, I read this really amazing um, article in the New York Times and, and the title was called Blackness Deserves a Seat at the Seder. And it was about <laughs> African American Jews. Hmm. And it talked about how food, you know, the, the celebration of Passover, the reflection and celebration of one's own culture and their destiny. It talked about liberation and freedom and emancipation and how they're not unique to what one person may think of when they think of a Jewish person. And I thought, this is great. Because when I went to Israel, I was struck by the similarities between Palestinians and Israelis. And when I read the article, I was reminded of the diversity that is the Jewish community, mm -hmm. okay? And the diaspora that is reflective in Judaism. And so how even within the Jewish community do you see difference and talk about it? Like that's how we begin to unravel misinformation and fear. Uh, so those are my thoughts. Love that, love that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. If I could just leave you with a visualization that has always stuck with me. Many of you may be familiar with the story in Billings, Montana. When a rock was thrown into a window of a home, a Jewish home that had a menorah um, shining its bright light in that window. And the very next day, the community printed the menorah in the newspaper. And every single community member cut that out and put it to their window in a, shot, in a, in a, in a, a beautiful um, uh, a moment of solidarity. And I think that as we've seen ADL numbers show an all-time high, as we see the AAPI community being targeted, as we see the LGBTQ and, and uh, kind of rise in anti-misogynistic uh, um, or misogynistic attacks, this is all a moment for all of us to come together and to be those allies, not just show up, but actively engage. And so we all have a moment to engage with our voice right now. If I can transition to my housekeeping notes, an opportunity for advocacy. And let's just first give our panelists a, a wonderful round of applause for really painting this beautiful landscape. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership and your efforts.